Welcome uh, to this Zoom event at the Hudson Institute. Today we're going to be talking about Israel at 75. As the state of Israel celebrates 75 years of independence, it is experiencing some of the most acrimonious political and social discord in recent memory. Friends and allies of the Jewish state are trying hard to understand and to influence the outcomes, while Israel's enemies are testing its defenses and its will. Today's panelists will share their insights about what we can expect to see in and around Israel over the next 75 days and with an eye to the next 75 years. I'm joined today uh, by Yaakov Katz. Yaakov is the immediate past editor-in-chief uh, of the Jerusalem Post. Bob Harkov is a senior contributing editor uh, at the Jerusalem Post and uh, the Post uh, diplomatic correspondent. And Ambassador Mark Regev, who is the chairman of the Abba Eben Institute for Diplomacy and Foreign Relations at Reichman University. Uh, so welcome to all of you. Uh, Lav, I'd like to, to start with you, if I may. Over the, the, the past several months, actually since the election in November, there's been a, uh, a barrage of headlines um, from around the world. Uh, just, there were some examples I found uh, I think it was uh, a day or two after the election, the Washington Post said that Israel takes a troubling turn toward a liberal democracy. Um, in December, the New York Times said the ideal of democracy in a Jewish state is in, in jeopardy. Uh, Bloomberg in March said Israel's democracy is at its breaking point. Um, but you wrote uh, a thoughtful piece last month, uh, and the headline was Israel's democracy is not in peril. So my question is, What's going on right now in Israel? What's at stake and how do we get here? So Israel's now having a debate over the role of the judiciary and the sort of uh, balance of power within the government. And I think it's a, a fair debate to have. I think that different democracies and different liberal democracies have different models of the relationship between the judiciary and the legislature, the judiciary between the executive, et cetera. And the proposal of the current government, it did, it was is very far reaching. I don't think it's so far reaching as to not make Israel a democracy anymore, but I think that it is very, very far reaching. And what we see, you know, the, the protests in the street, we see that that there's a lot of Israelis who think it's unacceptable. And so, you know, we, we are having an internal debate, right? Like, first of all, the, the reform has not been enacted yet. There are small parts of it that have advanced in the legislature. Um, so, so certainly the democracy is not dead. But when we're talking about it being in danger, in peril, I mean, it's part of the democratic process and it's not the first time it's happened in Israel. And I'm sure people in the US recognize it as well that, that you know, sometimes there will be proposals that will be really far out there. And when you go through a normal democratic process where there's a, a coalition and an opposition or in the US you have two opposed just specific parties, right? They debate it, they bring different proposals on how to moderate it and it comes out, you know, it doesn't mean that it'll come out good, right? It's everybody has their own assessment of it. Um, but that's the, I think, you know, that that is the correct democratic process. And the fact that people are able to go out on the street and protest and for you know, 99.99% of them are not encountering any kind of police violence or not encountering any kind of sort of government um, pressure you know, that's impacting their lives beyond in any inappropriate way. That is also a part of a democracy. They are exercising their free speech. And so I do think, you know, I, I think that the judicial reform in some ways goes very far um, but I think that the that there's a level of panic sort of that's that's not warranted because we are still going through, you know, the democratic process. That being said, um, this is this is something unique. It is a unique event. It is different from things we've seen before in terms of how many Israelis are out in the street, sort of the passions and the way people who tend to be, I don't know, moderate and even people who are not the most political figures have come out and against this judicial reform. So it's not something that I want to downplay in that sense. I think that this is something is happening. You know, there's something major here. Um, but I don't think that this is the end of Israeli democracy. So what what makes this moment special? That is, why is why is this reform being put forward now in the way that it's being put forward? 
put forward and why do you think uh, the response has been as, as, as loud and as powerful as it's been? Well, there's, I would say there's two different elements to why it's happening now. Um, the opponents of the reform like to say it's happening now to help Netanyahu get through, you know, his uh, trials or he's um, charged with numerous counts of corruption. Um, that being said, you know, the charges happened a few years ago. Um, he could have tried to push it before, and there were some elements of it that they had tried to push before. But really, I just think the reason it's happening now is because the Netanyahu can do it. There's nobody in his government right now or there's like a few individuals in the coalition, but basically there's no party in his coalition that opposes judicial reform. Um, and most of them even support, you know, sort of the most, I would say radical change in the judicial reform. Um, the thing is also that people act as though this came out of nowhere and, and it didn't. Um, Yariv Levine, the justice minister, he entered parliamentary politics in 2009. And he has been talking about this ever since. This has been sort of his pet project. And he over, you know, there was support for it in Likud already, but it wasn't like a, a top issue for Likud. And he managed to gain more and more support for it over the years. Um, and so it's not really new on the right. What's new is that there is no one to the left of Netanyahu that he has to negotiate and compromise with. Netanyahu is the person who had to say, we should take a pause because there's such strong opposition to it. Yeah, Yaakov, the, the coalition, the opposition are negotiating uh, under the auspices of President uh, Herzog. Where do you see these talks going? I will find, I'd be very surprised if they succeed. And I think that what we're seeing happening right now is that both sides are kind of positioning themselves for the day after when these talks fail and who can blame who and who will potentially take the fall. We see that the protests are continuing. Um, Yair Lapid, the head of the opposition, is still taking a very aggressive stance against the judicial reforms and against any compromise that would be too big. On the other hand, you also hear people from the coalition who are saying that come after this recess that the Knesset is still in till the end of April. It reconvenes in, I think, April 30th or May 1st for the summer session that they plan to go back to the original slates of legislation and to pass it through. So I would be very surprised that if there's a deal that everyone is going to be happy with. And I think that what we will continue to see is ultimately the standoff between those who want to see a judicial reform in the way and in the scope that the coalition originally presented and those who don't want to really see much of anything. Because Jonathan, when you think about it, you could slice this thing a million ways to Sunday, right? You know, the 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 number of just of who how do you point Supreme Court justices? So you could say it could be this way or that way with this percentage, that percentage, the override bill. It could be with a slim majority, a, a super majority, a percentage of the opposition. There's a hundred million ways to go about this, but that, that that's not the issue. The issue really comes down to something that's much more substantive, I think, which is um, how, how much of the power do they want to give to the coalition, and how much does the executive branch take of the of the authority to itself when it comes to the judicial reform? And that's where they're still going to be very much divided. Yeah, it seems it, it has seemed throughout that each side is using its own means of applying pressure to the other. So the coalition has been able to continue advancing uh, the legislation, which puts pressure on, on the opposition. And of course, the opposition has said, we don't, want to, we don't want to have any negotiations until this stops. And the opposition has you know, continued to encourage the, uh, the protests and the strikes and things like that, which obviously puts pressure on, uh, on the coalition. So it feels like so if you look at this thing broadly that there is a, some sort of a negotiation that's been going on from the beginning, just each of them is, is trying to apply pressure. So the question is, okay, if it goes back to a standoff, as you said, then what? Where, where, does, this, where does this end? Well, or doesn't it? Right. I mean, I, I don't know how it ends necessarily. You know, I hope and pray that there is a compromise, but I don't know that Netanyahu, for example, can give Lapid and the more uh, extreme members, let's say, of the opposition and the protest movement, what they would want 
for the protests to come to an end, right? Let's remember, Netanyahu, because of his trial, I think at the end of the day, if we look at the entire legislative agenda here, so personally, I'm in favor of a lot of uh, uh, many of these reforms with different tweaks, right? When it comes to like how we override, how we select our Supreme Court justices. But what Netanyahu really needs at the end of the day when it comes to his trial is the ability to appoint Supreme Court justices. That's what this is about for him from his own personal perspective. There's an appointment that's coming up in October. That's the president of the Supreme Court. Esther Chayut steps down. They want to get a president of their own in that role. They want to, There's going to be another justice who steps down shortly after. They want to appoint someone from the right and who might be sympathetic. Now, they'll argue that it has nothing to do with the trial, right? It has nothing to do with Netanyahu's own personal agenda. But the fact of the matter is, is that his court, his case might come to an appeal one day. And also it sends a message to other people who are currently sitting in his trial and overseeing the trial in the district court that if they ever want to be one day up for an appointment to the Supreme Court, this is how it's going to work now. So if they want to have that coalition majority in the in the appointments committee, how can they give that up, right? So if they're willing to give it up completely, it doesn't end. And unless the, and if they're not going to give it up completely, then the process will continue. So I think that ultimately it will come to a point that Netanyahu will have to decide, do I bring it to a final vote or do I not? And let's remember, all, he can do the vote the moment the Knesset comes back into session and he has a majority to pass it. It's already passed the first reading. Second and third reading, it's ready to be brought and that's a quick vote and you don't even have to give much of a notice that the voting is happening. So that could happen very quickly. And I think what if that does happen, it will take some of the air actually out of the protest because people will wake up the next morning and realize the country hasn't collapsed. Everything is pretty much still okay. They might not be happy, but I think that you know life will potentially go on in Israel. And, and those justices that you said were going to step down, uh, just to clarify for our viewers, that's because uh, they're going to reach the, the age where they, they are required. Correct. In Israel, there's a requirement you can only serve on the bench until the age of 70. So once you hit 70, you automatically have to resign from the bench. Okay. Uh, Mark, let me let me ask you, you know, there's a tendency certainly here in the United States to present the Israeli public as as being as divided or as tribalized as the American public is is understood to be. Do you think that's fair? Do you think that's the case in Israel? Or is there more common ground for some sort of an eventual, if not political compromise, a social compromise? I think I think the, the paradox is that they're both true. Israeli society is, is very divided. It's very polarized, <clears throat> excuse me. And at the same time, if you actually look at the issues, we're not so divided. And it's, it's, a, uh, it's a, the contemporary Israeli paradox. I mean, you've got one group of people who are out there and they're saying democracy, democracy, democracy. They're saying that these reforms are the end of Israeli democracy, that they have to be stopped. They say, because we have a unicameral system in Israel, only one parliament, uh, 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 and we have a parliamentary system, uh, whereby, uh, uh, so the government and the parliament, the legislative branch are one. And so without an independent judiciary, we don't have democracy, you don't have checks and balances, and any attempt to undermine the existing power of the uh, uh, judiciary is going to uh, um, negatively affect uh, and even destroy Israeli democracy. And on the other hand, you've got people uh, who say that these reforms make Israel more democratic because you have this Supreme Court, which is all powerful, which is unelected, which self-perpetuates itself. That's one of the arguments they use. And unless we open up the Supreme Court and we balance it out and we retweak the relationship between the executive and the legislative branches and the uh, judiciary, then we're, we're not really a democracy. It's, they almost say their words, my words, not theirs, but like this is an unelected House of Lords that is more important than the elected institutions. So that's not democratic. So both groups, when they demonstrate, proudly wave Israeli flags. Both groups, when they demonstrate, proudly say that they want to make Israeli democracy stronger. Now, you ask a question, but on the issues, are they divided? So Lieberman, who is one of the most, uh, him and the Labour Party, his party and, and Mirav Mikhaili's party, who are the most strident that it's, it's crucial not to make a, a deal with the government. Uh, Lieberman's on record as saying he supports an override bill of 70, right? That's been his position, his party's position for years. Now, the government has already reached 65, if I'm not mistaken. So to find a compromise is, is 
is relatively easy if you want to find a compromise, right? You can find a 69. If 70 is all right, is 69 the end of democracy? Is 68 the end of democracy? In other words, a lot of this is because it's become politicized and polarized. So it's, you know, people are, are sitting up where they want to be and, and, and casting positions. But is there really such a substantive difference? Now, Yaakov could well be right when he says he believes it's doubtful uh, that there can be a compromise. I'd like to be, with your permission, a touch more optimistic and I'll articulate why. Number one, if there's no compromise, we're back to where we were before Netanyahu uh, deferred the legislation. That means massive demonstrations again. That means the Histadrut, the Israeli Labor Federation, closing down the country, maybe not just for, for 10 hours again, but for, for, for much longer. Uh, and you have the country back into this very polarized. Who wants to go back there? Now, maybe the, the more radical side of the coalition, of the opposition wants to go back there because they want to bring the government down. But does Netanyahu want to go back to also the polling? Netanyahu has seen this has not been good for his polling, right? He has an interest in putting this behind him in a way that he's not defeated, but to put it behind him. So I think there is a political logic to try to find a solution. And I think the key person here will be Benny Gantz, because I agree with Yaakov. I think it's doubtful that Yair Lapid is going to agree to a compromise, but you don't need Yair Lapid. You only need Benny Gantz. If Benny Gantz and his people can agree to a compromise with the government, he it becomes legitimate. That's then a consensus. And it doesn't matter what Lieberman, Merab Micheli, and I even dare to say it doesn't matter what Yair Lapid thinks. If Benny Gantz and the Likud can make an agreement on a compromise, I think the agreement will have acceptance. It won't have acceptance for the people out there demonstrating who say crime minister, and they're against the government from the start, right? That they want to bring the government down. But for the majority of Israelis, right, I believe that can work. Now, will Benny Gantz do it? It's a good question. Netanyahu in the past, you know, many people say didn't treat Benny Gantz nicely. There's no reason why he should be nice to the prime minister. But even politically, you look at Benny Gantz's numbers in the polls, and we all follow them very closely. He's shot up. He's, he's gone ahead of Netanyahu and Yair Lapid as the favorite for being prime minister, precisely because he's being the responsible adult, precisely because he's being the one in the center who's talking about compromise. So maybe he understands that this is a way for him to positively differentiate himself from Lapid and Michaeli and Lieberman and put himself into the national leadership. Yeah, I think it's interesting because if you go back, uh, I don't know, a month ago, five, six weeks ago, there were polls that showed the current coalition not having the numbers to form a government if there were elections held uh, today, but nobody was able to. That is, it looked as if you had if you had gone to elections on that day, and if the polls were accurate, that you'd be back at the same sort of stalemate that uh, that we saw before the elections in November. But now, over the last two three weeks, we actually see um, what you've been describing is not just that that Gantz has 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 had a surge in the polls, but also that the current opposition actually does have the numbers to uh, to form a government uh, of its own. How stable that would be, how long it would last, you know, of course, are, are open questions. But, uh, Lav, let me ask you, you're uh, a close follower of the uh, the ins and outs of Israeli politics, probably more than any of us. You know, how do you think this dynamic will affect the conduct of the current government moving forward. And I think it's also interesting to note that I think it was just a day or two after the elections that Gantz had announced that he wasn't going to enter you know, a government with Netanyahu uh, under any circumstances. And I'm not suggesting that that's, that's changed now. What I'm saying is that Gantz was a, was a key player, even in November, in setting up the dynamic of the current government. And now he's in this interesting position again. So where do you see, how do you see that affecting things moving forward? Well, Netanyahu is kind of trapped, right? Like I think he looks at the polls and he sees that Likud voters don't want him to be so extreme. Um, you know, there's, there's an interesting sort of identity element of this whole debate that we didn't really discuss, but, um, and, and to some extent, it's it's not reality, but the way many people see this debate is one between sort of the elites and the like uh, grassroots sort of minorities and people who feel downtrodden by the elites. 
And so on the one hand, Netanyahu's coalition is sort of a coalition of these people who feel that they have been, I don't maybe oppressed goes too far, but discriminated against by the elites. And on the other hand, some of those people, you you have the Haredim, the, the ultra-Orthodox, you have um, Itamar ben Gvir, who's like a extremist figure, um, extremist nationalist figure. Um, and you see that Likud voters don't necessarily relate to those parties, even if it's a big uh, theme, I would say, in Likud politics, you know, opposing the elites. So, so, so on the one hand, you have that coalition. On the other hand, his internal party doesn't really want to coalesce with those people. But Netanyahu doesn't really have a choice at this point because nobody who is outside of his current coalition wants to be in a government with Netanyahu. Um, you know, and they they say as long as he is on trial for corruption, that's sort of the the rule sort of that they've made, the line that they've drawn. Um, but I think it goes beyond that. I think that at this point, the opposition voters or a, a large number of the opposition no voters just see Netanyahu as persona non grata, even if the trial ends and Netanyahu is innocent. Um, and so it's, it is a really difficult dynamic and I'm not really sure I see it changing. If anyone could compromise, it would be Gantz. However, you know, he, as you mentioned before, he compromised in the past and, or, it didn't really work out. Um, you know, Gantz blames Netanyahu and Netanyahu blames Gantz, but either way, I don't see Gantz, you know, joining in the Netanyahu government so quickly. But that's a, to be fair, love, that's a different question about the reforms, correct? I never, I didn't say he was about to join the government. I said, is there a chance that he can agree to compromise? It's a lower bar. I'm not saying it's going to happen, yeah. but is it impossible? No, no, I, I agree with you. Jonathan had asked me, I think, about forming a coalition. I, I think that Gantz could, I mean, they'd have to reach something that would be very different, I think, from what the government proposed. Um, yeah, because I, Gantz I mean, I, can't compromise on a little, oh, Gantz can't just give a little, get a little compromise out of them and then say he won. He has to exact a big compromise out of them. But I, I think that if anyone could do it, that would be Gantz. I, I just think we have to remember about Gantz is that right, so right now he's soared in the polls, right? BB, the, Netanyahu and Likud have dropped about 20. Gantz is suddenly at 29. And he's jumped by about 10, 12 to 15 seats almost. These are people who come from like the moderate right who are parking themselves right now in Benny Gantz's party. They're, they might not necessarily, they're probably not going to vote for Benny Gantz because by the time there's a new election, You'll have Naftali Bennett, the former prime minister, who comes back. You'll have other people. There will be a new kind of reshuffle. So Gantz has to say to himself two things. One is these voters are just here temporarily. And two is that the moment I compromise or I give the stamp for a compromise, I will get hammered by the people on the left. So Lapid and Merav, you know, the people Mark mentioned earlier, Merav, Merav Michaeli and, and Lieberman. And then I might even go down even more. So is the price, what, what's the benefit that I'm getting politically? Now, I think Mark, though, is right to an extent. Benny Gantz's fundamental flaw as a politician is that he's a good guy. So, so the reason that he might actually do it is because he'll say it's for the good of the country. And that sounds so crazy that politicians would actually do something that's for the good of the country. I say that with sarcasm, but but I think that that that, that might be actually something that Gantz would do. That could be the the, the benefit. I think By the way, that explains. Oh, sorry. I was, that explains why the moderate right, I think, is parked by right. him because when you look at his actual policies, they're not actually right wing policies at all. They're moderate left, I would say. I think also, I mean, when we look at Benny Gantz and he looks at his political future, he can't out Marav Mechaeli. You know, he can't be more radical than Labour. He can't be more radical than Lapid. He's got to carve a place out in the center, right? So he might go down from 29, he can go down, but maybe he believes, right? Especially because of the Haredi issue and other issues, by being the responsible center, he can, you know, what is he, how many seats does he have today? He can go up from that. And that's enough for him. Um, yeah. I'm just saying, and maybe I'm expressing an optimism and a hope because the alternative polarization and national strikes and going back to where we were three weeks ago, I mean, who wants to go back there, right? But I think there is also a political logic. I mean, once again, the Histadruta, and I'm not a big fan of the Histadruta, uh, though I'm theoretically a member, I presume, but the Israeli Labor Federation, I mean, has a lot to answer for, yes, in their behavior on all sorts of issues. 
But I think the way that they closed the country down, right, uh, which forced the prime minister's hand, that threat is always there. Once again, if we don't get a compromise, it makes the situation very, very uh, difficult uh, for the country. The threat of closing this country down, the airport, everything gets closed down, yeah? What, is that not over the prime minister's head? Is that not over everyone's head? And it's not just the unions, it's the leaders of business closed down the country too, right? It's this national coalition, which is there with a stick. And they say, if you guys don't reach a compromise, we're shutting the country down. I think it's a very powerful stick. There's, I think there's an, uh, uh, an open question about how much appetite the public will have for that. You know, if you have, you have a general strike once, you have it twice, you know, um, I think people, uh, you know, are, will be more tolerant of that than if it becomes something that's, that's chronic. I think it's interesting, you know, looking back even, uh, I think, to the 2009 elections and forward, it feels like there's this, this block of about 30 seats that keeps moving from from party to party that identifies itself as the centrist party. So, you know, you had Kadima and you had the Nua and you had uh, the you know Yesha Yesha has had its ups and downs, and it's so it's it's interesting to see that right now um, uh, Gantz's numbers are where they are because it's, it it feels pretty consistent actually, sort of surprisingly consistent the the number sort of a plus or minus thirty. It just keeps moving from party to party, depending on whichever party is 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 styled as the the centrist party of the day. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, I think it's true. I also I think that a lot of it has to do with the fact that labor used to be a more diverse party. You had labor hawks and labor doves, and you had labor socialists and labor sort of neoliberals. And today they're they're socialist doves only. And so the people who were like the labor hawks and the labor neoliberals needed to find a new place to go. And that's why when Herzog was head of labor, they got back a lot of those voters because he was in that sort of older, less extreme, less left-wing vein of labor. Right. But a lot of those people have found a home with Benny Gantz. Yes, if you look at his voting yeah. range, uh, like he does very well on kibbutzim. He does very well in, in traditional labor stronghold. He doesn't necessarily get a majority. But he does well. Those old, what can we call them, rubbinists or the old, uh, uh, you know, the old, as you say, labor hawks, the people who used to be like Moshe Dayan was in the old days, yes, they feel comfortable with many guns. They don't, they don't necessarily feel comfortable with Yer Lapid, which is interesting. That is interesting. Now, now Gantz, of course, comes from uh, comes from a military background. And and Yaakov, I actually I wanted to shift gears for a moment. Um, you've covered Israeli security year, uh, issues for many years, and in just uh, a few days ago, we've been uh, um, Defense Minister Gallant referred to what we've been been seeing over the last several weeks. He called it a, a, a multi-front war of uh, attrition against Israel being waged by uh, Iran. Now, I think I would argue that that war has been going on for a long time, um, but it certainly seems to have escalated in in recent weeks. Um, what what do you think is going on here? Again, why now? Do you think it's it's directly related to the domestic issues that we're talking about, or is there something else going on? Well, I think there's it, you know I think it is related, right? Directly related is is a, is a tough question, but definitely related because look around. I mean, you know, I look at it from the Israeli perspective. When Iran has protests, Israel Israeli decision makers sit back and they say we don't necessarily have to do anything right now. They're going to rip themselves apart. Let's wait to see. Maybe this will bring down the Ayatollahs. Or if we can do something now, maybe that can escalate and speed up a potential collapse of a regime. So they looked at what's happening here, saw hundreds of thousands of people coming out to the streets on a weekly basis, right? The equivalent, just for our American viewers, the equivalent of about 8, 9 million Americans, if you look at the percentage of the population, coming out weekly across the United States. I mean, it's unheard of in the United States of something of that scale. And, and with that kind of continued power every week, now 15, 16 weeks in. Uh, so I think, you know, Nasrallah in, in Lebanon, Assad in Syria, definitely the Hamas guys in Gaza, everyone sees this happening and they see an opportunity. So it wasn't for no reason that Nasrallah sent a terrorist across the border a few weeks ago with explosive devices. 
it would it blew up near the Megiddo Junction in the north. There's questions of why that was where the, the terrorist had gone and he didn't try to attack a place, a city further north. But if you put that aside for a moment, when was the last time Hezbollah did something like this? It hasn't happened since 2006, since the Second Lebanon War, right? The fact that you have rockets being launched over Passover on three different fronts and from Syria, from Lebanon, the largest salvo and barrage from Lebanon since that war, and from, of course, the Gaza Strip shows that they're interpreting this opportunity. At, you see an erosion of Israel's deterrence. So that is definitely something that we have to be aware of. Now, of course, it immediately becomes political. Right. So the people on the opposition will say Netanyahu has done this. He's ripped the country apart and our enemies sense that weakness. The coalition members will say it's the protesters who are to blame. They're the ones with their calls for what we call in Hebrew Sarvanu to refuse orders. Pilots who are saying we will no longer come for reserve duty. Our enemies see that as an opportunity for that we're weak and for them to attack us. So of course, the situation is immediately political. But I think there's no doubt that Israel is in a very precarious situation right now from a security stand, standpoint, right? And then when you put into the to the you put into the wider context where Iran is and its pursuit of nuclear capability, and while in Israel maybe they're talking about it not as much as other countries, but there were just a few statements made recently in the United States by the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the Director of the CIA, William Burns, of just. They could, they're weeks away from having a what we call an SQ, right? A significant quantity of fissionable material of enriched uranium of military grade level. They could be at a bomb capacity within a year after that. This is happening, right? And instead of us dealing with this massive situation that's on the horizon, working with our friends in America, working with the Europeans, Israel is fighting among itself. This is just an overall bad situation. Yeah. And yeah. Please, love. Yeah, I think it was in the 2015 election where Netanyahu was asked some sort of question about the cost of living, and he answered that he he is dealing with life itself, and his you know referring to Iran attacking, not attacking Israel, um, and and I feel like this is a situation also where you know the 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 sort of life itself element, um, people were distracted from it or not on you know off the ball. And uh, and things have gotten have really deteriorated just in the past few weeks. Um, I think that Netanyahu sort of hoped that he could focus on the Iran things, the the foreign affairs things, and the defense things, because those are his favorite topics. While Yariv Levine would take care of the judicial reform, but it things got so bad that he had to, you know, shift to the topics that he doesn't like as much. Yeah, and here, I mean, I think the the examples that Yaakov gave, notwithstanding. You know, Iran continues to enrich. They continue to to be, you know, in violation of their nuclear obligations, both in and out of the JCPOA. Uh, and for the most part, nobody's talking about it. It's not in the headlines. It's not seen as a, a major newsworthy issue, certainly not here in, in Washington. I wrote in, in this week's Jerusalem Post um, a piece where I was testing the proposition. Is it possible? I, I mean, we've got to try to understand Biden has spoken a number of times about judicial reform, have, as have the other uh, uh, Secretary of State and others in the administration. And to a certain extent, could there be a policy here of making sure that when, and we've seen Netanyahu's recent interviews on, on American media, they, they, he, 90% of the interview is about judicial reform. Is that maybe comfortable for the administration? Do they want to keep the heat on this issue so he doesn't talk about other issues? Um, Maybe that's, I hope that's not a conspiracy theory, but it's good politics from their perspective, yes? Keep Netanyahu under pressure on the judicial reform. Don't let up. Every time he goes on Meet the Press, and I think he's done it twice in the next last couple of months, right? You, you, he's, 90% of the interview, he's playing defense. He has to justify what's going on in Israel. And if Iran gets a mention at all, it's a peripheral in the interview. And it's, I presume it's the same in his meeting with legislators. It's a very smart strategy if the administration doesn't want to talk about Iran. Yaakov, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think you gentlemen know this much better than we do as, as veterans of the Netanyahu uh, office. But the 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 first of all, the bandwidth, right, when you're dealing with such an issue, which is ripping the country apart, and we know that this coalition, every day there's some crisis, right? I mean, every single day there's a new story and a new crisis, and you got to buy... I, I, 
I imagine it's, I know it's like a fireman. He's always running around with like a fire extinguisher, putting out fires all the time, but also having to try to find a way to move ahead with the judicial reform. And as Mark said, he's got this going on, right? It's just, it, it doesn't, it doesn't come up in conversations. How do you even manage that at the moment, right? And, you know, you, you guys were there, so you can definitely talk to how it, you know, can the prime minister actually do all these different things at the same time and keep, give the same attention and the same focus in these conversations that he's having with world leaders? Yeah, I think actually with, with world leaders, when you're in a small meeting, it's actually easier to focus the conversation uh, on the things that you want to talk about. But, but, that, but the public debate is, um, is, is much harder to control, and that's, it's clearly not on, on these issues. Mark, you served as an Israeli diplomat uh, around the world. You served in China. You were, of course, Israel's ambassador to the United Kingdom. You served here in Washington. How do you see uh, current events in Israel affecting Israel diplomatically? So it's clear that uh, Netanyahu has recently visited four uh, European heads of government. He was in Italy. He was in Germany. He was in France. He was in uh, um, London. And in all those conversations, uh, it said in the press releases that his European counterparts raised the issue of the reform, even in Italy, where they have a government which is also accused of being on the, on the far right, um, uh, Mrs. Maloney. But, but to what extent is it a real issue? And I can be, and maybe I'm wrong to be, but I could be a bit of a cynic about this issue because America has relationships with all sorts of countries uh, for its own national security reasons. We just saw... President Biden, on the anniversary of the outbreak of the invasion of Ukraine by the Russians, uh, he was hugging the Polish leadership. Uh, and people in Israel who are against the reforms say that's where Netanyahu wants to take us. They, we're going to be like these post-liberal democracy. We're going to be like the terrible, their words, the terrible Polish and the Hungarians, right? That's what they say. And yet Biden is hugging these people. And so one has to ask, what is the motivation, right, of the administration to get involved in such a the nuts and bolts of an Israeli political debate. Um, I was actually surprised when uh, uh, last time Biden came so hard on the issue, because ultimately he spoke after this, or Netanyahu had already deferred the legislation, and he spoke after the compromise talk started at the uh, at the uh, uh, under the auspices of the Israeli president. I would have thought the right thing for the president would say, "Well, it's good that the, you know Netanyahu I support him that he shelved it, and it's good that they'll try to get a compromise." And he didn't say that. He attacked the reforms again and attacked Netanyahu, even raised questions if Netanyahu really wants a compromise, yes? So one has to ask, what's going on here? Now, it's possible Biden has a history of speaking off the cuff. We all know that. Maybe he was just, you know, talking without giving consideration to his words. But goes in, I'd raise the issue again. Is it possible that it's good that this issue is talked about in Washington at the expense of other issues because then no one's focusing on what Yaakov was talking about before? Yaakov, did you, what do you think? Look, I think that, you know, people look at Israel today and we're on the verge, we're on the eve of our 75th anniversary. This is a moment for celebration. I mean, who would have imagined 75 years ago, 80 years ago, that we would have a country as powerful, as successful, as vibrant as the country that we have, and we'd be celebrating 75 years and instead of this country being people out in the streets celebrating and saying, wow, this is incredible, right? 75, it's a bit, that's, a, that's a pretty remarkable feat. There's a feeling of depression across this country, right? And, and it, it, this is what we did to ourselves. Whether the reforms are right or wrong, it doesn't make a difference. That's the reality. And you can't escape it. So anyone who's looking at this country today is wondering what in, what in God's name is going on in Israel. What are they doing to themselves, right? You know, you would expect to be attacked by somebody outside, but that's not the case. This is Israelis doing this to Israelis. So I think that it, it definitely, it, it, it changes our standing in the world. And, you know, you see the economic fallout, you see the, the way we're being criticized around the world. I mean, again, you, you both know this stuff much better than I do, but when was the last time a U.S. president said in front of a, of a camera, asked, are you going to be inviting the prime minister of Israel? And his answer was no, right? I mean, you know, that 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 sends a message. Israel was, was for years perceived as the gateway for many countries to access in Washington. 
And that helped Israel cultivate and forge many of its diplomatic alliances throughout the world. Today, Israel, people know that Netanyahu doesn't have that open door or access with President Biden at the moment. And, and that does impact our standing. If we want to normalize relations with additional countries in the Middle East, primarily Saudi Arabia as an example, we need American involvement and American buy-in. We don't, I don't, it doesn't seem like we have that at the moment. So this whole event that's taking place in Israel, it, it, the scope of it and the, and the impact is much wider and greater than just about how do we appoint Supreme Court justices at the moment and how many Knesset members are needed for an override bill. This is really impacting us on multi, multi, multiple levels. Bob, let me ask you, I see you know this sort of circling back to where we, we started with some of the criticism from abroad. How do you draw the line, or actually, where do you draw the line, and, and how do you differentiate between you know, sort of constructive criticism from, from worried friends and supporters um, and those who um, would attack Israel under any, you know, see it just as an, another opportunity to attack Israel um, regardless of the circumstances? Because I think there's, there's clearly some of both going on. Well, I think that you you have to look at the broader context, right? So we're talking about, you know, Netanyahu visiting all these European capitals and, um, you know, it's it's like not so surprising to hear criticism of Israel in any of these capitals, even though, you know, Germany, the UK, like these are good friends of Israel, but they're, they're good friends of Israel who are maybe more openly critical of Israel than, than say the US usually is, or at least US presidents usually are, not all, but usually. Um, and, and so you you kind of have to, I, I think, you know, that, that when you look at the context and whether these countries are more critical of Israel in general, you can decide whether you want to take the criticism with a, a grain of salt or not. So the, the Biden thing, I agree with Yaakov that it's, it's very jarring almost how, you know, adamant Biden is about this specific issue. Um, and that's something to take seriously and to give some thought, though I, I do think that the Biden administration in general has it like has its own agenda when it comes to Israel and doesn't necessarily want to talk about the things Israel wants to talk about. Like with before Netanyahu was prime minister, when it was Lapid or Bennett and they wanted to focus on Iran, for example, um, you know, the, the Biden administration kept pressing on the Palestinian issue just, and and so maybe that gives some support to what Mark was saying, that they just don't want focus to be on Iran. Um, but when you look at the Europeans, like, I feel like the Europeans, they, they support all kinds of NGOs that have long said that Israel is not really enough of a democracy. Um, and they've had criticisms in that vein uh, when it comes to the Palestinian issue as well. And so, it's not to say like there there is what to criticize and there is what to debate about the judicial issue, but I think that that those criticisms might be taken less seriously. That being said, some of these European partners are important on the Iran issue as well. Um, so it, we we just have a few minutes left, and I want to shift gears a little bit um, from from the now to the tomorrow. Um, so, you know, as, um, as Israel and, you know, its friends and supporters uh, abroad are getting ready to celebrate uh, 75 years of, of Israeli independence, um, what do you guys, what do you guys expect to see in the next 75 years? I know that that's an easy question to answer, but you're at this, this critical uh, point in history um, what do you see moving forward and can answer it politically, socially, and prospects for war and peace? What, uh, what are your expectations? Yaakov. Uh, listen, it's very difficult to know what's going to happen. Uh, but I think that the, the current status of Israel can give us an, ind an indication, right? This judicial reform fight it will end at some point, right? Whether it ends in a new election, it ends with legislation being passed, it ends as Mark's optimism with maybe a compromise, which I hope it'll end and, and we'll move on to the next big issue or, or challenge that we face. But if you look at Israel in a historical context, in the arc of history of the Jewish people, you see that the Jewish people, the Jewish nation has never been as strong as we are today. 
militarily, we have many challenges. We spoke about some of the, you know, the three fronts from which rockets were fired just a couple of weeks ago. The IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, can take on all of those challenges. And Iran, with this pursuit of a nuclear capability, that would make it an existential threat, but they don't yet have it. And hopefully they will never have it. And I, I'm pretty confident that Israel will do what it takes to stop them. Economically, we have energy independence. We have a amazing uh, tech industry now maybe uh, taking a blow because of what's happening with the judicial reform, but that will bounce back. Our GDP per capita, I was looking at the numbers, were over $50,000 today. Just 30 years ago, we were $20,000. I mean, like, th think about that for a moment. Not to mention, go back to 1970, right? We were $2,000. I mean, this is, it's, it's remarkable, just the, the growth in Israel. And so I think when you look at that and you put into a context, we, we have power that we never could have imagined that we have. And then the question comes down to, so what are we going to do with it? And these are the big issues that we have, whether it's the Palestinians, it's the integration of the ultra-Orthodox into the workforce, it's into the integration of Israeli Arabs into society. Those are the issues that I would like to see 75 years from now being dealt with, maybe solved, maybe we're, we're a whole different country, because we have this amazing strength today that we can use to catapult ourselves to a, to a much better place. Lav, where do you see it going? So... You know, I think that Israel has always had this tension of whether it is a Jewish state or it's just a state where Jews live. I think that a lot of that tension is coming to the fore in the debate about judicial reform. I know that's like a very big thing to say at the end without us really getting into it, but I do think that that's a big part of this debate we're having. I don't think it'll ever be settled, but I, if I could, you know, engage in a little bit of a wishful thinking, I, I hope that this will lead to a process that will bring about some kind of constitution that will bring us to some sort of stasis, some sort of place where we're settled and, and the sides can live with each other, even if they disagree within a certain defined rules of the game when it comes to Jewish and democratic. Um, and that, you know, um, hopefully this crisis and, and this instability is, is an opportunity to build something new. Ambassador. I get to finish. I'm very uh, uh, honored. I, I want to say I, I want to share the optimism of, of, of Yaakov and Lahav. If you look at any trajectory, right? Uh, Yaakov said demographically, militarily, economically, uh, um, uh, and diplomatically, every trajectory, you look where we were 20 years ago, you look where we were 30 years ago, you look where we, we, look where we are today, Israel is unquestionably an amazing success story. Um, we're now close to 10 million Israelis. GDP per capita we've talked about. I remember, and maybe I'll finish with, I'm the oldest person in this conversation. I remember the, the period after the Yom Kippur War, I was in high school, but I remember it, I remember thinking as a, 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 as, as a teenager, Look, we've just had this terrible war with the with the Arabs, and they have this oil weapon where they can dictate uh, their demands to the world, and 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 countries have to listen to them, right? And and we're outnumbered, and we're outgunned, and and what's going to happen? You look at the situation today, right? The Yom Kippur War is what fifty years ago. Um, today we've made peace treaties with the countries that we fought with in the Yom Kippur War. Not all of them but many of them. And if they had the oil weapon then, maybe Israel in the 21st century, we've got the oil. I mean, Israeli technology is maybe what the world needs in the 21st century. We are empowered in a way that we've never been before. And so I think there's every reason to believe that Israel is uniquely positioned to succeed in the years ahead. And I think that gives me confidence. Uh, and I'm not a naive person. I know the challenges. So. And what Yaakov said, what Lahav said, the ultra-Orthodox is a challenge, the Iranians are a challenge, the relationships at home. There. But if we just look at where we've been and now where, we're go where we are today, we continue on the same trajectory. The news is only good. At least the big picture is only good. Yeah. Well, on that uh, optimistic uh, and very positive note, uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, all of you for uh, for joining us today. I think this was uh, uh, undoubtedly enlightening for our viewers. Um, thank you all, and please uh, stay tuned for more uh, 
for more such events uh, at the Hudson Institute. Thanks and uh, happy Independence Day to all of you.